Hello, good to be with you. Thank you for your company. We have some wonderful readings today, and we're going to look at Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 to 17. Wonderful stuff. Uh, let's pray first, though, shall we, before we go any further. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of your word, and our prayer once again is that you will come and speak to us through it. Build us up, we pray, in our knowledge and our love of you. And we ask this, Father, in the name of him who died for us, Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let me put the glasses on then so I can read what I've actually got in front of me. So today in our liturgical calendar, it's All Saints Day. We remember all the saints, all the Lord's people around the world, those who have gone before us and those yet still to come. And we look forward to the day when we will all be together, united with them in the eternal praise and worship of our God. And that is the scene painted for us in our passage from the book of Revelation today. Now, this is the first time that I've preached on a passage from this book since arriving at St. John's. And so I'd like to take a little bit of time with it first, setting up some parameters that I use whenever it comes to this book. As you've probably worked out already, I love this book. I think it's absolutely fantastic. And I have encountered some people over the years who have been surprised when they hear that. They've said to me, is it not full of weird, if not frightening, symbols and images? Well, of course, that's true. It is full of frightening symbols and images. It uses a form of literature that would have been very common to the people to whom John wrote it, but is not at all familiar to us. It is an apocalyptic letter. What is that, you might be saying? What is an apocalyptic letter? Well, in order to answer that, there are firstly two things that we want to understand. First of all, what does the word apocalyptic mean? bring to your mind? End of the world stuff? Something cataclysmic? Maybe there's even an, a zombie or two in that picture for you somewhere. Two weeks ago, we saw in the episode of the Golden Calf how the culture that the Israelites grew up in influenced them. And we reflected on how their, and indeed our own, growth in discipleship increasingly replaces the values of our culture with God's own values. But sometimes our culture brings more of an influence on us than we realise. For example, our culture has meaning and values around the word love. But God's meanings and values around that word are different, as Marianne covered in her sermon last week. And the same has happened with the word apocalypse. I'm going to put Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1 on the screen for you now. Here it comes. The revelation of Jesus Christ. So, the first five words of this letter are those. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you know what the Greek word for revelation is? This may surprise you. It is the word apocalypsis. So the title and message of the book is literally the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. So apocalypse here is not about end of the world stuff. That thinking didn't really start in our culture until the mid 19th century. The definition of apocalypse as a cataclysmic event is also relatively modern. And those meanings have influenced our reading of this book. So in the biblical meaning of the word as used here, it is the book of the revelation, the apocalypsis of Jesus Christ. It is a book about Jesus. That's what apocalypse means here. So with that done, what is an apocalyptic letter? Well, let me illustrate this with a story. And Bear with me, a picture of a pork pie is about to appear on the screen. I brought this in Borough Market in London when I was there in November 2018, and it is without doubt 
the best pork pie I have ever tasted. It weighs 1.8 kilograms, it is delicious, and I believe it has to be the best pork pie in the world. And this pork pie was made, as you might be able to see on the sticker on top of the pie, by a company called Mrs. Kings of Nottingham. No relation, in case you were wondering. Now, I'm very aware this is a bit random, so please bear with me, because I know what you're thinking. What has this got to do with answering the question, what is an apocalyptic letter? Well, let us imagine I write to Mrs. Kings of Nottingham to congratulate them on the magnificence of their pork pie and proclaim my confidence that a day will surely come, I believe, when it will be recognised as the best pork pie in the world. Let us then further imagine that they reply with a letter of their own, thanking me and expressing the same hope. Between the two of us, we have now generated two simple bits of literature, two letters or epistles, if you prefer. But what is an apocalyptic letter? Well, imagine then, I received this from Mrs. Kings of Nottingham. Dear Richard, I have to tell you that I had a dream in which my pie was its normal size, with a flag of Nottingham in its crusty lid. Then I saw it walked out, ate the other bakeries in Nottingham, and grew in size. It marched across the UK and Europe, eating all bakeries before it. As it consumed, it continued to grow, until, the same size as the moon, it towered over the whole earth. With the marks of the Union, the blue stars of the 27, the stars and stripes and maple leaf now embedded in its pastry bonds. My goodness, what drama! Mrs King has sent us an apocalyptic letter. It is the same vein as our first two epistles, for it still expresses the hope that this pork pie might be proclaimed the best of the world, but it does so now in a very different way, using symbols and other worldly images. And in case you wonder, the marks of the Union is the Union flag of the UK, the blue stars of the 27 is the European Union flag, the stars and stripes and maple leaf, well of course, they are the US and Canadian flags. We know exactly what the phrase stars and stripes means, don't we? Obviously we know what the maple leaf refers to, but people in the first century wouldn't have had the foggiest idea of what they mean. They would have had to have learned what the phrase means today in order to understand the letter's meaning. They would have been very puzzled by Mrs King of Nottingham's apocalyptic letter. And we have to do the same with this letter, this revelation or apocalypsis of Jesus Christ. We have to work at understanding what the phrases, the numbers, the symbols and the images would have meant to John's first readers. So to read the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ and not be pulled into all kinds of interpretative problems, I can barely say that, requires three things. And I found these three little guidelines to really help me when I've read this book and when I read this book. Uh, I'll put them on the screen for you now. Here they come. So the first thing is to remember that it's an apocalyptic letter. It's not a regular epistle. It's not history. It's not poetry. Secondly, to work hard to understand what the symbols, numbers, images and phrases meant to John's first readers. And then thirdly, let scripture interpret scripture, meaning that we look for clues to understand this book by understanding how the same symbols, numbers and images were used in other places in the Bible. And of course, step three applies to all the Bible. Whenever we read any part of it, it's always good to let scripture help us interpret scripture. So with those three guidelines, a framework to help us read this book, we start by understanding it's an apocalyptic letter in which Jesus Christ is revealed.
But what does that mean in practice as we read it? Well, here's just one example. When John says in this letter, then I saw, then I saw, and then I saw, because it's an apocalyptic letter, we need to avoid the temptation of reading it with the assumption that it is referring to sequential events in history, as we tend to do with non-apocalyptic literature, for obvious reasons. So with all of that, by way of an introduction, what is it that John is wanting to reveal first and foremost for us and to us in this wondrous letter? Well, it is the reassuring truth to people who are suffering that God is on his throne and however it feels or whatever it looks like, that when suffering and tribulations come upon the Lord's people, Jesus still has all authority in heaven and on earth. He has conquered. He is all the wonderful things describing him in this book. He is the first and the last. He is the living one, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. He is the Amen, the faithful and true witness who holds the keys of death and Hades and who is the Alpha and the Omega. John is writing to people who are struggling. Many were facing severe persecution. And the revelation to them is the same as to those who suffer persecution today. Others, as we see in the letters to the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3, have succumbed to assimilation and complacency. Again, the revelation of Jesus to John's first readers is the same for us who face those two challenges today. So like all the Bible, this wonderful letter was written to them for whom it was first intended, but also for us and for every generation of Christians between them and us and the generations still to come. And what is the key, the core message of this letter? That Jesus is Lord of all and his victory is total and complete. However it might seem to you, the reality of our world is not what we see. For beyond the persecution, beyond this pandemic, whatever, it, whatever else it is you face in your life, there is the one who is seated upon the throne and the lamb who was slain but is now victorious. So don't lose heart, John is saying to us. John shows his readers and every generation of Christians since that whatever is going on, however difficult, there is a bigger world. The reality for us as Christians is not the world we see with our own eyes. For us then, John draws back a curtain. We may be so focused on COVID that we forget the world as it really is. And that world is where Jesus is Lord of all, the Lamb who is slain but is now worthy, and the one on the throne to whom all nations will bow down. And so complete is the victory of the Lamb that we can now, with confidence, look forward to being with our God and Saviour and with all our brothers and sisters in the Lord, with them, praising our God for all eternity. Jesus is saying, well, I was going to say, actually, John is saying, but Jesus is saying it too. Don't worry. John exalts them to hold fast and remain faithful to him who is the living one, the one at the right hand of the Father in heaven. For we too, can buckle when things are hard in our lives. Sometimes the temptation to be complacent or to assimilate to our culture comes our way. Or we don't think it's fair when we suffer for whatever reason. 
Perhaps persecution comes our way too. But whatever comes our way, what John is reminding us to do is to hold fast to Jesus. He is Lord of all. Let's always hold before us Jesus' final words on the cross. It is finished. It's done. Redemption's work is complete. Death and Satan are defeated for all eternity. So we join in praise. And we can join in praise now and every day, regardless of our circumstances, however hard things might be, with all the saints at the victory of the Lamb who was slain, at the right hand of the one seated upon the throne. And I'm going to put these words on the screen now. And let's close by joining together in praising our gods with all the saints as pictured in Revelation 7 in these wonderful words. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and might be to our God for ever and ever. Amen. Amen.